Back in the day, and by that I mean the 90s, <laughs> journalist Barbara Walters had a huge reputation for her interviews of celebrities and world leaders. She regularly had these primetime specials where she interviewed three people over an hour long show and everybody would turn in for these. Her interview subjects were often somewhat intimidated by and even a little afraid of her, partly because she could impact their careers and status with her huge reach, but partly because she had this reputation of getting people to cry. In 1996, Walters interviewed Annette Bening, who, if you're not familiar with, is a very accomplished actor. And part of the interview centered on Benning's marriage with Warren Beatty, also an actor, who had a reputation at the time of having been with a lot of famous women and not being able to remain faithful to any of them. So in asking about this relationship, Barbara said, you were pregnant. You had the baby before you got married. Why? Why didn't you get married and then have the baby? Walter's expectation, I'm sure, was that her reputation, coupled with societal norms about marriage before babies, would produce an almost apologetic mea culpa moment. But with total composure and grace, Annette Benning smiled sweetly and said, do you think that would have been better? And Barbara got all flustered and tripped over her words and said, yeah, I don't know, yeah, I guess I think it would have been better. And then she quickly changed the subject and asked if Beatty helped with the children. It was this rare moment to see Barbara Walters thrown off her game by an answer that she didn't expect. I thought of this as I read through our gospel passage for today, because in a way, this is how Jesus handles the chief priest and the elders. It is the last week of Jesus' life. Yesterday, he entered Jerusalem to fanfare and shouts of son of David from the people. He then drove out all of those who were selling and buying in the temple, knocking over the tables of the money changers and calling the temple of den of thieves. Today, he returns to the temple to teach where he is promptly challenged by the Jewish leaders who demand to know by what authority are you doing these things? This is a legitimate question. Jesus has stirred up the people and he's interfered with the function of the temple. The leaders as stewards of Jewish culture and society do not want to attract the concern of the Roman authorities. They have a lot vested in knowing what Jesus is up to, what his end game might be. And so they want to know what credential Jesus has that causes him to behave and teach as he does. They are prepared to counter any answer Jesus gives with their own formally recognized authority, for they are the temple leaders. In essence, they know that they can trump any answer on authority that Jesus might give. But Jesus, as he often does, and as Annette Benning did with Barbara Walters, answers their question with his own question. First, you answer me this. Did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? And like Barbara Walters, the temple leaders are caught off guard. They were expecting a straight answer, not a question. You can almost picture them huddling up and saying, if we say John's baptism came from heaven, he'll say, well, then why didn't you believe him? And if we say it was man-made, the crowd's going to turn on us because they believe John's a prophet. Neither answer works for us. Neither answer is politically expedient. It looks like we're going to have to punt. And so their answer to Jesus is, we don't know. And Jesus says, okay, then neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And Jesus then immediately goes into this parable of the two sons. A father asks each of his two sons to go work in the vineyard for the day. The first one says, I will not. But later he changes his mind and he goes out and he works in the field. The second son says, I will go, but does not. Who Jesus asked did the will of the father? The first, they correctly answer. Jesus asks his first question, 
was John's authority from heaven or man-made to give the leaders an opportunity to change their minds. He's giving them the benefit of the doubt that they might honestly want to engage Jesus. He's creating a space where the Jewish leaders can move from no to yes. When John came, they did not accept him and his baptism of repentance as legitimate. So here Jesus creates this space where they could have said, you know, well, we were confused by John. But having seen how his baptism of repentance has drawn people back into a lively relationship with God, having seen the fruit of his ministry, we accept that he was a prophet of God. But they can't bring themselves to do so. They calculate with their heads and don't speak truly from their hearts. Acknowledging John's heavenly authority might undermine their power and position and comfort on top of having to admit that they were wrong. And so they refuse to answer the question. They choose to cling to no. When Jesus sees that they are being willfully ignorant to the truth of John's ministry, and thus to the truth of his ministry, he refuses to engage or argue with them. Jesus is happy to debate anyone who honestly has questions about God's kingdom and his role in that. But he won't be bothered answering to those who do not question in good faith. What he does is tell a parable that reveals that those who do the will of the Father, who recognize what is God-ordained, even if it is a delayed reaction, even if they are slow to get there, even if they have to admit that they were wrong and change their mind, these will enter the kingdom of heaven. And those who know the accepted answers and say the right things and hold the most revered positions but refuse to mold themselves to God's will will struggle to enter the kingdom. We here at St. Michael are embarking on a great opportunity to say yes to God's kingdom. Last week, we kicked off our Building Our Future campaign that will undertake a significant upgrade to our church property so that we might better live into God's kingdom call on our lives. The easy, the expedient answer is to say no. It is to want to stay in our comfortable status quo instead of committing to the short-term discomfort of a construction project on the campus so that in the long term, we might more fully live into God's vision for us. It is to punt our commitment instead of intentionally considering how God might be calling us to support this campaign with our brothers and sisters who've already committed in a financially sacrificial way. There are many reasons we've discerned the need for this project, but the reason I want to emphasize today is our need for better community space. In this scattered social fabric of modern society, we no longer have communal gathering spaces. One of the reasons Starbucks took off when it was introduced is because of this need. It became a third space. We have our homes and we have our work environments, but we needed another space to gather. Starbucks provided this. As disciples charged with reaching those outside of our walls with the gospel, we need to prioritize having our own third space. We want to have inviting nooks and alcoves with comfortable seating where you can say, let's meet at the church, knowing that there will be a place for you to have your private personal conversation or to plan your event with your committee or to simply sit by yourself and read and have a cup of coffee or lunch or a snack. Our new space will have all of this. Further, our larger spaces and catering kitchen will be able to host anniversary celebrations and wedding rehearsal dinners and other events associated with the most important milestones in our lives. We want our memories to happen here, together. And we need to have time with one another on Sunday mornings. Currently, there are 14 different ways to enter our campus. 
If you go to this contemporary service, you may never run into folks on Sunday who go to the church service because you're entering from different parts of the building. Our new space will have a single main entry with lots of room for us to gather and visit before and after our worship services. When I was in high school, we had a central concourse in the building. And between classes with a 10 minute passing period, we all gathered in the concourse to visit for eight of those 10 minutes before heading off to our next class. It was a cacophony of conversation, so much energy. We were able to check in with one another and confirm plans and just catch up. This is what we want for St. Michael. We want to regularly see one another on Sundays. And the connections we will make more frequently with one another are important to our emotional and our spiritual health. And it will be a source of strength and growth for us so that having been built up here, we can turn around and welcome those from the community into our congregation. God has asked us to go out for the day and work in the vineyard. We can say all the right things, show up at all the right gatherings, and stay comfortable in our status quo which is a way of saying no. Or we can allow ourselves to be drawn into this new thing that God is doing. We can, regardless of any hesitation that we might have, step forward in faith and join the many members of this congregation who've already committed themselves to this good work. I challenge you, as you leave church today, to prayerfully consider how no matter the number of times you might have told him no in the past, that in this moment and in this circumstance, you might say yes to God. Amen.